welcome everyone to this year's Innovations in Healthcare Technology event. Um, I know it's a little bit different this year with our uh, going virtual. We want to thank everyone for, uh, for signing up and, and joining us. I think it's going to be a great event. I'm Ann Hughes, and I'm the president and CEO of the Technology Council of Central Pennsylvania, and it has been our honor and privilege to partner with our friends at the Penn State College of Medicine Center for Medical Innovation to bring you this year's event. Um, I'd also like to thank Life Sciences Greenhouse of Central Pennsylvania for their continued support of this endeavor. Um, and most importantly, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for agreeing to be a part of today's event and for their willingness to share their stories and expertise with us. Um, the Tech Council connects technologists from diverse uh, tech industries, backgrounds, and experiences with uh, lots of opportunities to learn, collaborate, and innovate while showcasing the technology that exists throughout the Central Pennsylvania region. This commitment has never been more important than it is right now, as we have all had to respond and adapt to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Hence the reason for this afternoon's theme, accelerating innovation in a time of crisis. The pandemic has forced all of us to revisit our everyday functions and business practices, our standard protocols and policies, the way we interact with our customers, our patients, and each other. We have all had to innovate in response. But the results of our efforts have not been without unexpected rewards, for it is often during times of crisis that some of the best innovation has emerged. This afternoon's three panels shine a spotlight on some of the technology innovations that have happened within healthcare, an industry upon which so much of the burden of the pandemic has fallen. Each of today's panels exemplifies how crisis has not stifled, but inspired great innovation and collaboration, and during a time when the stakes are so high. So before I hand it off to our first panel, because that's definitely who you're here to, to listen to today, um, I do have a few housekeeping items to cover. So one of those is everyone will remain on mute um, and your video will be dis disabled throughout each of today's panels. We do encourage you to submit any questions that you might have for our panelists at any point using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any um, logistical questions or issues that you need to contact our event host, please use the chat function to do so. And that's pretty much it. I think we've all been using Zoom quite a bit, so hopefully you're all comfortable with it and ready to go for today's event. And don't forget that at the end of today's panels at five o'clock, we'll go into a networking session using another platform, and we're really excited about that as well. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first panel. The theme of our first panel is the roots of innovation and will be moderated by Erica Swift, Swift with, uh, with Penn State, the Penn State College of Medicine's Center for Medical Innovation. If you'd like to check out the, uh, the list of our um, attendees, um, our, our panelists' backgrounds and their bios, they're all available in the booklet that you should have received a link to in your um, initial confirmation email. And for that, I'll turn it over to Erica. Erica, it's all you. Great. Thank you, Anne. Well, I will be your moderator for our first panel discussion where we will dive into the roots of innovation and look at how a volunteer team quickly assembled and addressed um, to address the COVID pandemic as it impacted our university, health system, and communities. But before we get started in our conversation, I would like to take a moment for each panelist to introduce themselves. So Tim, I thought we would start with you. Hey there, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Erica, and thanks, Anne, for, uh, for hosting. So Tim Simpson, uh, I'm at University Park uh, up in State College, uh, professor in mechanical engineering and industrial engineering. Also do a fair bit of work on 3D printing and added to manufacturing. And uh, I inadvertently, uh, I guess, founded, started uh, this mask initiative, uh, manufacturing and sterilization for COVID that, uh, that we'll talk about today. So thank you. Thanks, Tim. Barry, how about we go to you next? Uh, yeah, Barry Fell. Um, I've been an uh, engineering consultant to the Department of Surgery for about 10 or 11 years. So working primarily on medical devices and things like that, and have worked with Tim in the past, and uh, um, and Erica, you, and but everyone else on the team, um, you know, got to meet <laughs> very well over the last uh, four or five months. Richard, we'll go to you. Yeah, Richard Bagley, Senior Vice President, Chief Supply Chain Officer for Penn State Health. So I'm, I'm actually uh, in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So up on the old Hershey uh, headquarters where the Penn State Health corporate headquarters are today. So very happy to be here and uh, talk through kind of the last six months uh, whirlwind that we've been on. So I appreciate uh, the folks in the innovation group inviting us to do that. 
Thanks, Richard. And Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Anne and Erica, for inviting to be part of the panel. Uh, nice to see my colleagues from MASC on here. Uh, I'm a professor of supply chain and information systems in the Smeal College of Business here at Penn State up in University Park. Uh, Tim Simpson and I have been friends for many years, and we're still friends after MASK, <laughs> to say somewhat tongue-in-cheek. And it was a pleasure to work with uh, the other folks on the panel, Richard Berry and uh, Anthony, who's going to join us hopefully here in a little bit, as well as yourself, Erica. So, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Steve. And as you mentioned, um, Anthony Sai is a clinician who will be joining us, but he got whisked into a procedure, so he's going to be a little bit late. Um, but all in all, I am really excited about this panel. Um, it's often said that necessity is the mother of invention, and we fully experienced necessity starting in this past spring as we saw a global pandemic break down a robust supply chain network around the world. For the first time on a grand scale, ordering materials and supplies did not mean you would actually receive those goods. Um, and this actually jeopardized our health system's ability to care for our patients and protect their clinical staff. So I would like to start our discussion by understanding how Penn State, which is such a large institution full of independent silos of very various colleges, developed such a large multidisciplinary multi-campus group to form MASK, and, and which was an initiative that addressed the challenges created by COVID-19 and how MASK supported our health system. So I'm Tim or Barry. Anyone would like to take that one away? Sure. I'll I'll, I'll kick it off there and then let Barry pick it up. So, um, so yeah, I, I think uh, sort of around the time everything uh, started hitting, you know, the U.S. and Pennsylvania was uh, around our spring break. Uh, we were hearing news on sort of the, the outbreak coming. I was actually down in Florida trying to enjoy some nice time at the beach before it all hit. And, of course, by the time we came back, classes had been, you know, moved online. University was closed. Everything was was going awry. I was teaching a 3D printing course uh, at the time, so there goes lab uh, and everything else. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out what, what to do for a new project. And uh, so I was looking around at 3D printing. And of course, you know, uh, over in Europe, uh, a lot of things where the virus is sort of much more widespread and things going on, I was starting to see uh, people, you know, designs popping up, face shields, masks, door handle openers that people were 3D printing and sort of sharing freely and openly just given the urgency out there. And I said, hey, this, you know, they've been there a week or two ahead of us. We better start talking or thinking about this ourselves. And so I started talking to some folks here at, uh, at University Park, sort of we've got a, a group of 3D printing, you know, folks in, in engineering, arts and architecture, material science. And we just started saying, hey, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? Uh, I also reached out, having worked with uh, with Barry and um, uh, Erica and Randy and, and the team down there before, uh, Surgical Innovation Group. Uh, you know, said, "Hey, what do you what do you guys see in here?" And and sort of uh, found that they were uh, similarly concerned about what was coming. Uh, I'll put it lightly. Uh, they were likewise starting through uh, Kevin Harder and the Center for Medical Innovation there, starting to sort of coalesce some some you know, needs and interest. And, and we sort of, you know, one connector talked to another connector and said, hey, let's work together. And, you know, it sort of grew from there as we pour, pulled more and more people in. So let me uh, pause there and maybe Barry and uh, share a little perspective on what, what was going on on the Hershey front and uh, who, who, got loop, who got looped or wrangled into that next. <laughs> yeah, I got a call uh, a day or two before the shutdown from the chief medical officer, he said, you know, can CMI and Surgery Innovation Group help us? Where th there are some things that are critical, uh, critically short of, or we think we're gonna get short of. And so first person I called was Tim actually. Uh, <clears throat> so we kind of closed that loop. And then uh, uh, within a few days, uh, 24 hours probably, I was talking to Richard and um, I'm not even sure what day of the week that started, but I know that Sunday mornings at eight o'clock, I was in meetings with Richard and Peter Dillon and a few others looking at monstrous spreadsheets and trying to figure out what you needed today, what you needed tomorrow and what you ran out of yesterday. So it's, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty wild there in the beginning. Absolutely. Yeah, Brad, let's take us to the next slide. Um, it kind of shows where we got kicked off. So I think this was... Ground zero day one, um, kind of what was most critical. 
Yeah, I think I think on a on a note there, I, I do remember that call, Bear, and you were like saying, "Watch out, guess who's coming uh, <laughs> on this and, and people." But I, but I think to your point, it was interesting. So we we had already had some discussion going on, sort of a grassroots effort, right, of sort of like-minded innovators and thinkers that wanted to help, and then. You know, senior administration was now starting to talk. I think I don't know, Richard, if it was you or you know somebody CIO at, at Hershey had reached out to, to Laura Weiss and connected, and so we connected the, the the top top folks connected, the bottom folks connected, and I said, hey, we've already been doing this, and I think by the time they figured it out, we had already gotten a 3D print, printed it, and had a functional mass that we had given to Barry that he took by the next day. So. You know, to Laura, to Laura Weiss's credit, when she heard that and we chatted briefly, you know, she said, hey, do you want to run with this? And, uh, you know, I should have thought longer about it, but, uh, you know, we took off and, and then it went from there. So this is so that I think was on Friday night. I said yes uh, to Laura's call. Uh, Saturday, we had a, had a website and a listserv that, that we threw together. I raised some money just so we had some seed fundings and got some staff support. And then Kevin, you know, Monday morning, literally, we kicked off our first meeting uh, with uh, essentially, I don't even know who got invited to that table, why or how initially, but it was sort of like, okay, let's bring some people together. We're gonna talk every day and, and grow from there. And so, you know, Excel spreadsheet is not the first thing you think of when you're trying to organize a supply chain, but, uh, you know, to, to Kevin's, uh, you know, sort of foresight. It was an easy enough format that anybody could then pick up and take and edit and copy uh, as as people sort of came and went for the different projects. So here was, you know, literally our first spreadsheet. You can see we sort of working with uh, Richard Bagley and his group on what is most urgent, most critical, most needed, sort of who's given the request, when, you know, who's then responsible for it. So who's then, you know, taking the reins and and you know, making the connections and whatnot as that was going on, and then any other thoughts there. And I think, I think next slide, Erica, shows by the end of the week, you know, we were, uh, I think the number of projects had doubled, we were color coded, uh, tripled maybe, and you'll notice, of course, uh, most of them are in red. Uh, so, so that was not good. And I think it was about this time that I, I, I pulled in uh, Steve Tracy reached out to him and realized, uh oh, this is this is more than us designing and prototyping. If we're going to do any of this, we got to scale it and we got to start thinking supply chain stuff. So I knew St I knew Steve was always up for fun and craziness. So I uh, reached out to him and then he and Sue got on board uh, and just did a did a phenomenal job, you know, rescuing us time and time again in collaboration with uh, with the group and, and coordination with Richard Bagley and team. Yeah. yeah, I think, Richard, you you made a point saying, you know, we were in crisis management. This was not normal business. Um, you know, do you want to speak to that at all? And, and what was the impact on patient care? Yeah, I think the normal pandemic and supply for uh, health care uh, was dramatically tested very quickly and found to be lacking. So, um, you know, I, I remember sitting in the seat and uh, prior to the COVID uh, hitting us, there was a massive gown recall compounding the issue from Cardinal Health, where they had to pull 9 million gowns out of the supply chain just four weeks prior to the uh, big event of COVID. So we were already in a stressed out supply environment. And, uh, you know, the normal just in time strategy that all the MBA uh, pencil heads talked everybody into really hosed us. We all thought and trusted we just drop an order the night before and the magic uh, supply ferry cranks out a, a wonderful fulfillment of that and it shows up in a beautiful truck the next morning and in your hands by the afternoon. Uh, when that failed, pandemonium ensued because we soon realized that the suppliers to the distributors had uh, been having numerous problems. We huddled, I remember, uh, you know, uh, with Peter and several others on the Sunday morning and uh, started looking at supplies on hand and demand. We started with demand planning. And, you know, when you're looking at like 6,000 total N95 masks on the shelf and you plan out saying, well, what if we had to give 
a mass to every clinician. There's 17,000 employees, 6,000 clinicians. Uh, how long are we going to use these masks? How frequently we got to do those? And pretty soon, you know, your, your sphincter tightens a little bit and you start saying help. So I was very much appreciative of having the medical innovation team and then connecting us to my, uh, you know, brother from another uh, parent here, the university. And, you know, frankly, partnering like we had, um, we got through some very serious near challenges. And I, I want to say we are in much better shape today. Uh, we're all green today. But in those early days, you know, we ran the risk of running out of many critical supplies. But thank heavens, we never ran out of anything. And I, I think it's a tribute to Pennsylvanians and the scrappy personalities in the university and the medical innovation team that really made the day. If we were dependent on industry alone, we wouldn't be in as good a position as we are. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, I, I remember Steve even bringing up, you know, his experience from his time in industry and start bringing out that we should shift away from disposables, which is what was normal and customary and start to really look at reusables. I mean, Steve, did you want to talk about that at all? And, and what some of the role that reusables played in this? Well, you know, mask is a, masks and uh, and gowns are a great example. Um, you know, I remember the <clears throat> I remember the uh, the week in March because I got three separate calls at three separate times from three separate people on the same topic. Right, uh, I got a call from the senior VP, global supply chain officer at Hershey, the chocolate company, not not the healthcare system, who had gotten a call from Richard and his team because they're in the same neighborhood, saying, "Hey, can you help us out with some supply chain challenges we're having?" So Jason Ryman picked up the phone and called me and my colleague Sue Purdom and said, hey, you guys are the supply chain experts. Why don't you see if you can jump in here with your sister organization? Um, at the same time, I got a call from a friend at MITRE who was standing up the COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition, their supply chain, and uh, Tim Simpson, who said, hey, we're starting up this initiative. I don't think it had a name yet, Tim, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. It wasn't called Mask yet. It was just a bunch of folks getting together to see if we could do some stuff, like within a couple of days, one another. So we connected those dots. Um, and as we started iterating on some of the, you know, I, I remember the early days with the spreadsheet and the daily phone calls and the late nights. And um, innovation is about, you know, thinking about something that maybe has never even been done before or never even considered, right? Um, reusable healthcare products is not new. I mean, some of the colleagues, Richard knows this, you know, Fred Krantz talks about, you know, he was, he was doing that in the 50s and 60s, right? But because healthcare had moved mostly to disposables they had forgotten that that this, that reusables were there and um the data shows that well if everything is just in time reusables kind of has sort of limited efficacy it's good as a backup or you know in certain applications but when you're in short supply and you can use something 10 15 maybe 100 times boy that's that's gold right and so if you look at you know, what we did in, in various locales within the healthcare institutions, if you look at what we did with the nursing homes, you know, that was a godsend. And if you look at N95 masks specifically, and, and maybe Tim or, or Barry will talk about this, the real solution to N95 masks wasn't getting more masks. It was figuring out a way to reuse and sterilize the masks that we had and keep them in the system for three to five days safely for multiple uses with the clinicians. So um, that was a big aha moment, but for something that wasn't really new, it was just a reapplication of something that had existed before. Thanks, yeah, it was, I'm sorry, go ahead, Barry. I think uh, it might be helpful to the audience. Richard, if you could tell the audience, how many, prior to all of this, how many masks does the health system use in a day? and how many gowns and what kind of numbers that we were talking about here. Yeah, nothing like being put on the spot, Barry, but- uh, Well, they just ballpark, they won't know the difference. If we're ballparking, you know, for each OR procedure, as an example, where you would mask up, uh, whether it's a surgical mask or, or an N95, you got six people in there because we're teaching, times 100 procedures a day, and then you add in the procedure areas, 
you know, roughly uh, because you only need the N95 in the normal healthcare if you're doing an aerosolized procedure. So maybe we're doing a couple hundred of those a day and we're uh, isolation gowns, you know, maybe 200, uh, you know, well, about 1,500 a week maybe, all right? That's where we were clipping. When we flipped over to COVID and you've got to gown everybody going in and out, then the touches and the students and the nurses and the masks, you know, start putting zeros on that. And our demand, as we started shaping the demand curve, you know, it's 400% increase on some of the items and masks were 1500% increase. There's no production in the world that can scale that in two to three weeks. And uh, in, in, it really put us in a bind. Yeah, and so I remember, I, yeah, I remember the challenges. I don't, I don't remember the rough numbers, but it was instances where like a year's worth of inventory was used in a week yeah. sort of thing. And it, and it took us, it was about a week or two there where sort of, as you said, sort of the realization between placing an order and getting an order, right? This used to be very tightly coupled and combined, but not anymore. So we're, you know, through Steve, we're talking to UPS to get hold of customs because our masks are stuck on a ship that's impounded at Turkey coming from China, sort of. I mean, it was just, it was just ridiculous, some of these connections to do and, and make and just, as the burn rates went quicker, the need for, you know, local, uh, domestic, you know, reliable, you know, these, these sort of, these three key words or so and responsive trumped the, uh, you know, the cheapest, uh, you know, mask or N95. And you could see that reflected in prices. I still remember the, um, the, the disposable stethoscopes that were sort of this one-time use patient that were like a dollar maybe, if I recall, were upwards of six bucks to $10 within a, a two to three months, you know, lead time. So it was just the, the swings that were going on both in price and availability uh, and, and, and timing of things just were, just were astronomical compared to sort of normal day-to-day -day operations. Yeah, and I think you touched on a really good point there, talking about local, um, because this, you know, even though we were feeling this and this was so real to us, this was being experienced though across the country. So every health system was under these supply, you know, constraints, supply chain constraints, which was just compounding the problem everywhere. So there wasn't, backups were no longer really available. So we had to start looking locally. And I thought it was really interesting how the team started getting creative too, you know, as far as even how we did use 3D printing for paper parts and the disposable stethoscope. Um, Anthony and Barry, I know you guys in particular had a lot to do with those projects. Do you want to talk about how you got pappers back online or, and even tell the audience what is a papper? And we'll start there. Anthony, or you want me uh, yeah, Anthony, introduce yourself there. You and, yes. you and your students were were key to this uh, on many occasions, so please. Yeah, um, Anthony Simon, one of the pediatric surgeons here on campus. I uh, previously worked closely with Barry and some other folks on uh, finding innovation solutions. And uh, when all this started, uh, I basically recruited the medical students to help us do the background vetting and find out, you know, what our needs are and to find the regulations and the resources that we have um, for the different supplies. In terms of the PAPRs, um, you know, baby, uh, maybe Barry can give, give the details of PAPRs a bit, um, are uh, alternative to N95 Max for those people that have beards or have reasons that they can't wear the N95 mask that has good seal. So it's a uh, alternative way of protecting themselves. Um, and it requires a uh, face show that comes down and uh, a, sh a shroud that covers the neck area. And the whole thing is connected to a, um, a pump that uh, ventilates the, uh, the head area. So, um, uh, th that has to be one of the uh, s solutions 
um, along with the N95 mask that we have because not everyone can wear N95s. Um, and uh, Barry was instrumental in finding uh, ways to reproduce parts of the, uh, of the paper um, and, and shields that go along with it. Um, uh, Barry, if you want sure, to- Sure, the, so some of the, um, the uh, nuances of that is um, the health system in Hershey was using a particular type of paper. They also have St. Joe's Hospital up in uh, the Reading area. They used two different types. They had different use rates, different applications, different procedures, and so on. And so simultaneously, we were looking at solving the problem of two or three different types of PAPR units. Uh, bigger application was the one in Hershey, and uh, that went from um, uh, getting one of the, you know, the old ones, bringing it to, in this case, UPPI, uh, over in Mechanicsburg, who was already doing the face shields for us uh, and saying, can you die cut this? And they were able within a couple of days to get a die and start punching out that shape for us. Then we found another vendor down in York, Adhesives Research, who was another one of these unsung heroes who uh, found, you know, nobody was working at the plant and this, people went in, they found uh, spare materials that we needed um, that normally were at that point about a six month lead time to get. They, they had some samples there for us. Uh, they shipped them up to UPPI, they were die cut, and then I had a bunch of what I call minions who got together and, and, and assembled these, these things, which were really tedious to do. But as this project went on, um, uh, both UPPI and, and Adhesives Research started to automate uh, the process. So uh, by, the, by the time that that need sort of came down, uh, we had probably 8,000 of these, what they call uh, shield cuffs in stock. Uh, so we had plenty of that material. Around that time, other parts on the Papra helmets started to break. That's where the 3D printing came in. So we were printing some parts up there at Tim's lab, Sim 3D lab, some of the parts down here, we were getting others from uh, other vendors, 3D systems. And probably this is a good time to maybe even introduce the FDA because this is a medical device and not anybody can just go make a medical device. You're, you know, by law, you have to be registered. You have to use good manufacturing practices, et cetera, et cetera. And fortunately for us, they had these emergency youth use authorizations uh, uh, starting to be issued, which gave us permission to make these things. But it did not relieve us of the responsibility of having a quality system in place and that we met the functional requirements of what was being used, uh, you know, prior to the crisis. Um, Anthony's team, uh, the med students, you know, the way we were doing this and other projects, um, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but we had all of these resources and good ideas pouring in. We had to quickly sort through what's the best way to get something done. We also employed Google and other search engines. You know, the, the med students were amazing on this, but they would pull up all sorts of literature on this, other ways, patents and so forth. For all of us to look at. And then uh, when it was time to actually put a quality system together and have that in place while we were actually using it, uh, then, then we, we, we looped in the, the general counsel's office, Michael Brignati, into, into this whole thing. And normally lawyers don't speed things up, uh, but <laughs> Richard and I are both laughing here, but Michael was a, was a true chef. He didn't say, you can't do that. He said, let's figure out a way that you can do that. And to me, anybody else who's been out in industry before, that's revolutionary from a lawyer. Yeah, um, I was, so. was going to piggy, piggyback on that. And, and Michael Brignati is not here. Uh, he's actually, uh, he has since left Penn State, but I think he was certainly a key player from the start. He was on the calls with us, you know, pretty much every day providing uh, legal advice at counsel. He was the one, as, as well as I think Kevin Harder, that was looking at, at FDA website, you know, hourly for updates. I mean, the, the turnover there and changes was uh, faster than, than I could. So he would, he would digest it, you know, update us. He would look at, uh, we actually got uh, four or five agreements put into place uh, so that if one of the other Penn State campuses wanted to print face shields 
uh, for a, a local hospital there or something. Basically, we had legal documents uh, consistent with our quality system and, and what was needed for FDA or whatnot on what you could or couldn't do. So, you know, it, it, there was there was the you know the design and the manufacturing and the supply chain and the sterilization, but but legal was certainly uh, a key piece of that as well from start to finish. I mean, at the same time, I think we filed, what, four or five invention disclosures ourselves uh, on the, uh, what, 20 or so different solutions we came up with. And, uh, you know, back to Anthony and his team of students, the, the legwork and searches they did just made that whole pr process super easy as well, because now we knew exactly what was the patent landscape, the IP, I know, possible infringements and stuff. So it was, you know, these constant and daily discussions, daily meetings, you know, we all gave up our lunch break uh, for, what, eight or nine weeks there at least, coming together and, and everybody was there and reprioritized. Richard and or his team would say, yep, nope, we're good here. Uh-oh, we're out of stethoscopes in three days, you know, go or whatever. Uh, and then we would all sort of jump on and figure out, okay, who's going to run with this and, and go from there. And, and in doing so, that's how we ended up building out to almost 400 people on the team because we'd have to loop in, oh, I need this expertise or I need that expertise or, well, you know, I think this person's doing that and we'd bring him or her in and discuss and involved and get them involved. And it just, I think it was a great opportunity as mass became a way for, there were a lot of people, you know, particularly at Penn State, but even all the local companies who wanted to help had expertise, didn't necessarily know how to contribute, but when they would come and learn about MAST and then or one of these teams, it was like, okay, hey, that's something I can do, you know, sink my teeth into it. Now I feel like I'm part of something. And, and we were very fortunate to be able to harness that because nobody, nobody on any of these teams, we were not being paid to do this. This was all volunteer work and effort and, and nights and weekends and evenings and you know, every day I wrote a weekly summary or a daily summary, just sort of the top, I think, Steve, you were calling it my, my top 10 list, sort of, of all the craziness that happened that day, right? That became like the record of who was doing what and, and trying to give a shout out to, you know, Anthony did this and Barry did this and Richard did that and Michael helped with this and, you know, bless Sue Purnham's heart and Erica rocked this one, you know, and it just became became a way of sort of keeping people, you know, energized and, and marching forward, given, given all the whiplash and setbacks and hurdles and everything else we were encountering at the same time. Yeah, so let's take a look at a couple of these solutions. Um, Brad, if you can uh, progress the slides to two, one more. There you go. So this is just so the audience can see some of the things that were being generated. And it was an amazing amount of work and just awesome on how quickly all these engineers came together. But even though we were able to make it, the thing that was so amazing to me too was Penn State's health leadership and how they made themselves available. And Richard, I know you work very closely. Do you want to speak to that and, you know, and just talk about how we were able to not only create the, but then become solutions that were implemented? Yeah, I, I think uh, a normal process in a hospital is multifaceted going through several committees to consider new products. And obviously with the velocity of change had to dramatically uh, adjust. So, you know, I was fortunate enough, we put together a command structure in both the hospitals and the central um, corporation where I'm sitting in the room representing supply and we're communicating on a daily basis on where we're short or challenges. And we immediately aligned the chief medical officer, chief nursing officer, the administrative officers throughout the entire corporation. And uh, infection disease and risk management were all sitting at the table. So something that took typically, you know, a few weeks, if you're lucky to get through, was happening within hours. And we connected all the people to work actively towards the solution. So, you know, the, the infection control folks really were the gatekeeper on the quality. And they were hand in hand with Barry and, you know, uh, Dr. Sai and others as they were working through trials and tests and validation. 
Right, and also, and I, that, I, um, you know, we were getting, of the 400 people, there was nobody saying, go build this or whatever. People on their own initiative who had access to 3D printers or a sewing machine would just do things. They would get sent down here. So within 24 hours, they were in front of those people at that committee, whether it was the whole committee or individually. And so everything moved at sort of light speed. So if there were changes that needed to be made, they got made. You know, they got noted, they got made. Um, uh, if there were uh, problems on, you know, function that we weren't aware of, or 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 Richard that day, ten minutes before, found a new solution in the marketplace, and then twenty minutes later found out that nope, that's not going to happen. You know, so everything was moving like that. And um, at the health system side, it, you know, nobody in the world, <laughs> Steve will back me up. Nobody ever deals with a big health system at this speed. And that was really the key to getting everything uh, going and keep going. Same, but by the same token, when we were looking specifically, say for gown materials or masks and so forth in the early days, the face shields, that was three, probably three total days of effort before it was in production. So that picture in the lower left corner is UPPI, who added a second shift on, I think within the first week, and, and they're doing that in a clean room of a product that they hadn't been making, you know, four days earlier. So, uh, and, and, and then we got into the gowns, you know, we were, we were looking at, you know, little sewing companies, bigger sewing companies. We were sourcing the raw materials, the fabrics directly from the mills. We were, you know, it, we, when somebody says they have four rolls of fabric to send you, you may want to ask them how big the rolls are. <laughs> Because these were thousand pound rolls and they weren't going to fit in my garage. So again, we had to go back to the supply chain saying, do you have an available warehouse? And then we had to go find somebody else that could, what they go re-roll these things so that people could actually handle it. So that's some of the craziness. Well, I want to stay yeah, on that craziness for a little bit. I mean, because Barry, there's more to that story. I don't know if you want to share, you know, as far as how you <laughs> came to get some of those materials. Oh, <laughs> Well, in the, I think I made it to probably the state police watch list for drug handoffs because I was meeting, you know, companies halfway between their place and our place all the time to pick up samples and bring them back. Because when you think about it, if somebody's three hours away, you know, we can, you know, I can do that trip in three hours round trip if they meet me halfway. Right. And then I would drop it off at one of the people that worked for Rich's house or I'd meet them over at the warehouse or wherever it had to go. Um, where there's a will, there's a way. And it wasn't just me. It was just everybody that I was dealing with was working at that pace and, and, and level of commitment and help. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, similar. I mean, we, we had that. I actually I remember I remember the day we had to start our, our transportation services to, because you know, State College and, and, and Hershey are an hour and a half away, but uh, Lisa Keller stepped up and organized that, and basically it would be, okay, let's, who's, you know, who's in State College that can drive, who's at Hershey, let's meet halfway, and, and Crystal, I can't, I lost track of how many trips you made, but it was, you know, we basically, we closed the distance, I think, as, as Erica has said there, between State College and, or uh, between State College and Hershey, and so that made, I, I'm looking at, as you were talking, the, um, the 3D printed stethoscope uh, in the upper right hand corner of that, you know, Richard on, on Friday during a call is like, uh oh, you know, we're going to be out next week. We need these stethoscopes. I texted, you know, one of my uh, former students who's now a professor. She got a group of students together, hacked up four designs over the weekend. They were in a car uh, Monday morning. They were delivered to Anthony by, and Barry by uh, noon on Monday that next day that then they were testing and said this one's good that's good actually I think Anthony I think you guys took took parts from all four of those made your own Frankenstein one sent that back and then we you know produced another five of those so it was just I, I lost track of how many road trips we did but but every one of those was like that these clandestine drop-offs and pickups of materials and supplies uh that that again lisa I, I think when we mapped it out i think we went i think we traveled enough to go uh zigzag across the u.s twice uh at least between june and august when we put all the mileage together <laughs> yeah it's 
Uh, Brad, let's move to the next slide just to kind of show the industry partners as well, um, you know, because I do want to touch about that. You know, how did the local and national industry partners play in the role? I mean, we've been talking quite a bit about, you know, all of the work with the engineering teams and the Penn State Health leadership and administration. But I mean, we couldn't have made this happen without our partners. Does anybody want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, I think Barry, Barry raised the issue there with, with FDA, right? I mean, these are medical devices, medical products, and we did have EUA to sort of produce them. But end of the day, you know, we're not having students make these in a machine shop and then go on, uh, you know, get in the operating room. So, so we would basically iterate and prototype. And as we were doing that, we would then try and identify, okay, what companies can we work with to scale materials, production, assembly, 3D printing that are GMP compliant, this, that, or the other. And so we've been fortunate through, again, our collective connections. Uh, you know, some of these are, are startups and, and companies here in State College. Others are ones that, that Hershey worked with. Uh, others, interestingly, heard about us and wanted to then collaborate with us and test their, their material or this or that. So some of these are Pennsylvania companies that, that found us and, and had a solution. So again, end of the day, we knew we had to work with companies to make these happen. And, and like UPPI, again, is a perfect example. They've now made over a million uh, face shields uh, since they basically, since Barry went and visited them and they, they turned around a new line production what six months ago so just they saw the opportunity uh the you know doing it locally uh having a a, a reliable uh a supply chain there became key and and they all stepped up as well as as the folks on mass all right and there's there's a number of, of other companies that are missing from the slide because if you go back one step further in the supply chain uh, in, in the case of protective gear, the non-woven materials that are made, uh, the woven fabrics that are made, when the, the crisis really hit the, the nursing homes, you know, we've been kind of looking out for ourselves and we were barely just keeping up with, the, you know, the solutions for the needs. But then when we started hearing stories of, you know, the nursing homes having to wear plastic bags and rain ponchos for gear, um, we, we, we realized that they had nothing. And they, they've been hooked on the disposable, you know, juice for a long time. And of course, in their industry, everything was price driven and so forth. And, and really with Steve's background, you know, at Standard Textiles, where uh, in, in their size of a market, like for, for Penn State Health to go reusables is a logistics nightmare because you have no place to put all the dirty clothing because you go through so much, especially, you know, during a COVID uh, event. But in the nursing homes, that's something that they could handle. And Steve had the expertise. And he, you got your, your, your Rolodex out and started calling people. Sue started calling people. Uh, I was getting samples almost like every other day of, of these materials. And then I was bringing them out to the various sewing outfits to get them converted. Then we were getting them trialed. And in the meantime, you know, Anthony's group was looking at what was required from an FDA performance point of view here. You know, were they class one, level one, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And what, what, did they, what did they need? Did they need level one protection, two, three, or four? Did they have to be full-blown surgical? That brings us into the story about some of these things had to be sterilized. <laughs> so those two guys, at least on my screen in the upper corners, uh, Tim and Steve, they've got a story about, you know, if we have to sterilize them, right? And, and all of the sterilization companies in the in the country were just book solid. There was no way or time to get anything sterilized. So I'll let so those. I, I think I think Steve, I think we haven't so we haven't heard from Steve in a bit. So I think I think he should tell about all the all the adventures and places he got to go to in our quest for sterile gowns. <laughs> I seem to end up with all the wacky stories in this whole event. Um, uh, there's a couple. The hardest thing it was to find, and, and Anthony will remember this, was I was trying to find a PTFE filtration material for him for ventilator parts. That was a lot of sleepless nights and phone calls, and people were like, I think they thought I was trying to buy yellow cake or something. I'm not sure what that was, but that was the hardest one. Uh, the other one, it's over there on the right-hand side. I wish we had time for this story, but we show Storyteller FX Group. 
that's a company down in Atlanta. They do special effects in the movie industry and we suck them in because their CEO and I are close friends and we needed somebody to build prototypes of sterilization units and components for a sterilization unit. And they're used to building stuff without a drawing, right? Believe it or not, we like, well, we kind of think this is what it might look like. And so John Baker and his team spun up and built us some prototypes of sterilization units and some other stuff. So that's a whole, and the funny part about that whole story is my, my Dean thinks it's hysterical is that, um, his, in his business, one of his clients is he does the special effects on the TV show MacGyver. So you can't make that stuff up, right? But the story about the gowns was, so I have a background in making reusable medical devices. And I work with Barry to get the gown sewn. But we said, well, what if we got to get these things sterilized? Where are we going to get them sterilized? So the process for sterilization is you package them um, in, a, minutes. In, a, in like a nitrogen sealed package. And then you have to radiate them some way so uh tim tells me he is well you know i think we have nitrogen packaging systems over in the meat lab and i said we have a meat lab he goes yeah over in in the animal science side they got a meat lab where they they teach students how to process meat for you know um for meat packing plants so um we hooked up with the professor over there uh i gowned up went over with him and we uh along with my son who's who's a, a grad student uh, we went over there and we sterile packaged gowns and then we took them over to a, another friend of Tim's over in the nuclear reactor and she and her colleagues sterilized them for us. So we had a backup plan to produce gowns, cut and sew them, package them in the meat lab and then take them over to the nuclear reactor to sterilize them. And you, again, you can't make that stuff up. True story. Now, we never got to do it on scale, but it was sure as heck fun to do it on, on a prototype basis. We got, we got pictures of it all. So we got pictures, we, we, yep. proved, we proved out that it could be done, and uh, I, I appreciate your help. I, I just made the connection. You, you ran these things around, so thank you. Oh, that was I'm fun. I'm, it was I'm fun. Come on. It was green. a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Steve used to have a hair before the radiation part of this. <laughs> Uh, oh, but I think that just goes to speak to all the ingenuity that everybody brought to the table. I mean, who would have put all of that together from, you know, clinical gowns, isolation gowns, to meat packing to a nuclear reactor? I mean, and, and I think that speaks to all the moving parts that went into this as well. I, I mean, really, at the end of the day, what was the secret sauce? What made this work? If I can start and I'll turn over to my colleagues. One was everybody that was involved knew what they were there for and knew they had a purpose behind it. So we were aligned behind a very clear mission that whatever we could do, whether it was for Penn state health and nursing homes or whatever, we knew we were trying to do something that had real importance and value. Number two, and I don't know how this happened. I give credit to Tim and others. Everybody left their egos at the door. Like when people stepped in, whoever you asked, it was like, look, we just need you to do something for us. You know, and the amount of volunteerism, I, you know, there were hundreds of people and probably hundreds of other unsung heroes who we don't even know about behind the scenes who helped us do this. And nobody wanted any money for it. Nobody wanted any credit for it. Matter of fact, most people were kind of like, I don't really want people to know I'm doing this. You look at all these companies who were willing to step up and volunteer their time and effort uh, a lot of times, you know, for free. To, to do stuff and make stuff and make prototypes. So from a leader, a true leadership perspective, a lot of the things that are bottlenecks, you know, whether it's legal, you know, Mike Brignati knocking down the walls for us on the legal side, whether it was, you know, um, the leadership at Penn State Health saying, you know what, we're going to, we're going to safely and, and quickly put aside some of our normal bureaucratic procedures and get decisions made. The leadership at Penn State supporting us, Laura Weiss, you know, uh, Kathy Bishke and others, you know. So it was a true example of what you can accomplish if you knock down the, the barriers to accomplishing things. Yeah, I wanna to add to that too. And think we had mentioned before that we had daily meetings around noon time. So the constant communication of what what is needed um, and having all the key players there in place to make decisions and to take the projects uh, uh, over, I, I thought that was uh, very important. Uh, if you think about innovation, you can't do it alone. You need a lot of uh, other people from uh, 
different disciplines to make it happen. And we had all of that in place at the meeting. We have people, um, we have um, uh, people from legal, we have Richard from supply chain, we have Steve who uh, has background in supply chain, we have the engineers, we have the clinical uh, folks. Everyone was at that meeting. And you know, if anyone is thinking about uh, innovation, uh, you gotta work as a team. Um, you can't, you really can't do it alone. And you have to um, use the expertise of uh, different people to, to your advantage. So um, we work great at, at, as a team, as you have heard, um, but uh, making that happen um, uh, in different uh, situations might be different, but you, you really need that. Five minutes. What other thing um, is, for all the attendees, if any of you, any of you want to get in the medical device business, or you want to get into some other high tech business, I think one other outcome of all of this is that, you know, University Park, it's a huge campus. They call it the silos. You know, I never knew Steve before five months ago, right? And there's a lot of other people like that. There are so many technologies there and at other campuses, and not just at Penn State, but there's a lot of technology sitting in companies as well. And often it just needs to be connected and it needs to have a purpose. Like, you know, I need I have a product, a problem that needs to be solved. Let's go solve it. And so we've kind of shown each other that we can collaborate. We we now know a lot more about each other for the 90 miles. But the same side on the industry, for those of you that are watching from the industry side that the, um, you know, call Erica, call Kevin Harder. If you have something that you've got, you might have a technology, you don't even know if there's a, there's a home for it at the med center, but there might be a home for it at the main campus. Or it might be that you just need some assistance to further develop something that you're working on, you know, to, to go put it out into some, uh, some other industry. So I think what we've established is that there's a means of connecting people now that wasn't there six months ago. And it turns out that it's a pretty effective way. A crisis is a good way of getting things done. Richard, and then uh, I'll add. Yeah, I think the people dimension to this, uh, you know, it felt pretty darn lonely as the world started collapsing in in the middle or end of March. And all of a sudden it got a little less lonely and a lot more friendly by expanding the problem set to some scrappy Pennsylvanians who wanted to roll up their sleeves and fix it. And I, I think the big takeaway story here is just, uh, you know, um, oftentimes we get trapped like Barry talked about in some of our silos, not realizing that, you know, just next door, there are all kinds of potential options and resources. So I, I very much appreciated that expanding my horizon, making connections I hope last uh, uh, for the foreseeable future in the university and the business community to make sure that we support our community with healthcare. Thanks. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think we were, we were blessed with, with sort of finding the right people. Uh, again, checking your egos at the door. I remember talking to my Dean at one point and just saying, you know, how do you get so much done? I'm like, well, if you, take out all of the crap and usual BS from a meeting and just, uh, you know, the, the focus on the five minutes of actual work, you know, that that's every meeting. And so the, you know, having the right people there, I think the key to that was sort of tapping into their passion. And so as Barry was saying, and, and Steve, it wasn't like we told this person to do that, right? Everybody came in and, and basically found something that they were really passionate about, thought they could contribute and then ran with it. Um, I think certainly the, the pandemic there was, gave us a clear purpose, uh, you know, and, and working, I think, directly with Richard and his team there, you also helped us prioritize that too, right? What do we need now then or the other? And so that became a way of, again, cutting through all the usual BS, figuring out what, what walls do we need to knock down barriers? Who do we need to talk to and, and really move this forward? And, uh, you know, a result of that certainly... I think the challenge, how do you, how do you bottle that and repeat that without a pandemic? 
uh, or without a crisis, you know, is certainly, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of articles and things out there on that. But again, I feel I feel very fortunate and blessed that anytime I send an email out or we had discussions that, that people were willing to step up, volunteer and help out. And, and I tried to acknowledge, uh, recognize and celebrate those accomplishments as, as much as possible. So couldn't have been done by, by any one of us. And you know, I'm sure there is, uh, as you said, there were a lot more than just the 400 people on our listserv that, that made this possible. So thanks to, to everybody out there in that regard. Great. Thank you, Tim. Was, well, that brings us to the close of our first panel. So I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists and for sharing the story of what has happened here at Penn State over the last seven months. I mean, I know there's been relationships established that will continue on and you know, and even now having such a greater understanding of, of our worlds, you know, I've never understood the health system the way I do now. And I will, you know, and that I'll take that forward in my job and, you know, and how I interact with our researchers. So it's been, you know, despite the fact that we're still living in this pandemic and as terrible it is, as it is, you know, there has been some really great success stories and ways that we can move forward from here to combat it. Um, so again, just thank you to all that were on the panel. Um, and I'm now going to turn it back to, I believe, Anne to take us into our next panel. Thank you.